This installment of the Anguilla Financial Services Commission's FinTech and Compliance webinar series was recorded on location at Tranquility Beach in Anguilla, British West Indies. Teresa Palanda joined the Access to Insurance Initiative in 2014. She is the lead contact for Central and Eastern Europe and the Caribbean region, responsible for A2II's implementation activities and cooperation with supervisors and regional associates. She is furthermore the A2II's monitoring and evaluation specialist and responsible for the topic of climate change and disaster resilience. In 2016, she was seconded to the Insurance Supervisory Authority of Peru, where she supported the modification of the current microinsurance regulation. Prior to A2II, Teresa worked as a consultant on inclusive insurance topics in Germany and Peru. She holds a Master of Science in Regional Studies of Latin America from the University of Cologne and Guadalajara, Mexico, with a focus on economics and cooperative studies. Good afternoon, should I say to you, Teresa. Good morning, thank you. So, shall we just um, jump right into the questions now that we've given our introductions? And my first question to you, Teresa, is what led you to work on microinsurance and other related initiatives? Thank you for that question. And I guess there are many reasons why I'm interested in the topic and why I feel insurance is an important tool to manage risks. One of them might be that I'm from Germany and Germany has a very long history in insurance. So it was already at the end of the 19th century when a social health and accident insurance scheme was introduced. So for me personally, insurance was always something I can kind of take for granted. And I always felt that I can be assured that whenever something bad happens to me, like an accident or a disease or whatever, I don't have to recur to um, my savings or I don't have to ask my family or friends for help to, for example, pay for a hospital bill or so. So this is a certain security that, that I, uh, feel and I'm also well aware that this is not the case or this is not the reality everywhere. So um, let me maybe share with you one story that was very impactful for me that was when I was in Lima in Peru in 2013 and I conducted some interviews with women for, who received a microcredit from a local microfinance institution. So I asked these um, women questions around insurance, whether they felt it was a useful tool for them to manage some of their risks. And then one of the ladies told me a story about her neighbors. So when the neighbor's daughter passed away, the family couldn't afford the um, cost for the funeral. These families were living in a very poor area of Lima. So they were migrate, they migrated from the Andes. They, did not have a social net they could rely on, which they probably would have had in their home country, in their home uh, villages. So it took the family four days to um, collect the money to being able to pay for the funeral. And in these four days, they were living with the dead body of her dead daughter in this very uh, simple one room uh, shanty in this uh, very poor area of Lima. So I thought that this was just such a terrible story and it, it was kind of a life changing moment for me because I also thought that with a very simple microinsurance funeral product with maybe a $1 premium or so, this is something that could have been avoided such a situation. So that was, um, yeah, clearly um, influenced my decision to, to work in the area of inclusive insurance. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you're right. I mean, insurance certainly provides a sort of peace of mind for persons. It's one of those things that they say um, you have it for when you need it. So um, moving on then, shall I ask, um, is that what influenced your decision to, um, to join A2II? 
Yeah, so definitely. So that was really a story that really touched me and that certainly influenced my decision to join the Access to Insurance Initiative in 2014. Because here at the HII, what we do is we work with insurance supervisors and regulators on supporting them in um, leading efforts in financial inclusion and market development for inclusive insurance. So since 2013 now we are the official implementation partner of the IAIS, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, and what we do is we um, generate knowledge on the topic of inclusive insurance, we provide supervisors with trainings, with webinars and so on, and we also facilitate a peer-to-peer peer, peer um, exchange between supervisors because we feel that there is so much experience out there. So it's also very important to bring together the relevant stakeholders. And it's not only supervisors, but it's also crucial for us to create formats that um, bring together stakeholders, not only from the supervisory world, but also from the industry, so that they can really enter into a dialogue and discuss the important topic of inclusive insurance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Um, and I realized, Teresa, that um, you refer to inclusive insurance rather than microinsurance. Can you explain a little bit of why um, you refer to it in that way? Yes, sure. So, yeah, I actually kind of prefer the term inclusive insurance because it is much broader. Microinsurance is really targeted at the very low income people who could just not afford the traditional insurance product, whereas inclusive insurance is targeted at the people who are, for whatever reasons, excluded or underserved. So affordability is not the only limiting factor. It's also um, can be awareness. It can be that people are not aware of the concept of insurance. They don't know the benefits or they don't know how to use it. It can always also be the case that there are just not the right products in place or people don't trust in the financial sector and are therefore reluctant to purchase any insurance product. So inclusive insurance is really much broader, but it certainly includes microinsurance. And what is um, very important for both, no matter if we talk about inclusive insurance or microinsurance, I just wanted to highlight that what is key, it's not just the scaled down version of a traditional product. It is a product that really has to meet the, the correct or the, the needs of the target group and their specific um, characteristics. So. Okay, great. Uh, so Teresa, um, can you tell us what transformations have you witnessed um, through the introduction of microinsurance products? Yeah, thank you for that question. And uh, what I wanted to highlight with this story I just shared with you, uh, my experience um, from Peru was that insurance can really make a difference and it cannot only make a difference on the individual household uh, level but more generally insurance can really contribute to national development objectives and also to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And although insurance is not specifically mentioned uh, in the SDGs, we think that it contributes to at least six of the objectives laid out there, like for example, empowery or have better health uh, systems in place. So when we look at what insurance, um, or what are the benefits of insurance? So as I said, on the household level, it can really help people to better manage their risks and to be financially protected against shocks. But it's also crucial for SMEs, for small, medium enterprises. And it cannot only increase resilience of these enterprises, but it can also increase productivity. So if an SME has access to insurance, it can be easier for them to get a credit, for example. And then also on the government level, also for governments, it can be crucial, or it is crucial to being able to increase resilience, especially now in the light of climate change with all these increased, um, these, um, very heavy um, weather, uh, natural disasters that uh, many countries are facing. So I think also here, in order to reduce the costs after these events um, from the public sector, it is also crucial to transfer some of the risks. So as I mentioned, climate change, maybe I also just 
highlight here the fact that with climate change, we see an increase in the frequency of these um, extreme weather events. And I think that the need for insurance is actually greater than ever. And it's not only climate change. We also see how important insurance is now in light of the current pandemic of COVID-19. So in fact, um, there are many reasons why um, insurance can really contribute to these um, broader development objectives. Yes, I, I certainly agree with what you have said in terms of the benefits of insurance. And us here in Anguilla, we are no stranger to serious catastrophes. And so we recognize the importance of having that cover in place um, for protection of, of income and for being able to protect property and replace your assets, etc. As well as the pandemic has also shown where there are weaknesses as well, where certain products can come in to kind of fill the gap uh, when you have persons that are displaced in terms of their income, etc. Uh, because of such external forces. And uh, Teresa, I know that you have already provided one example of how um, microinsurance or inclusive insurance can aid, but can you provide us with another example of how such products can assist low-income families? Yeah, sure. Um, so we have certainly seen an increase or a growth of microinsurance in the last couple of years. And I just saw a figure from the microinsurance center recently um, that uh, now um, about 280 million uh, people are protected by a microinsurance policy or by at least one microinsurance um, product. So this is already a very good development, but still considering a potential target market of about 4 billion uh, people for inclusive insurance, target, this is what we consider the target market for inclusive insurance, this is still a very small fraction of the population that really has access to insurance. But maybe before we talk about the challenges, you were asking for an example um, that I can share that shows the impact that microinsurance or inclusive insurance can have. So as we were talking about natural catastrophes, I can maybe share an example from you from the Philippines. And this is one of the very first examples that we have where microinsurance really covered a large part of, your, of a population. And that was already in 2013 when the typhoon Haiyan, it was a category five typhoon and it hit the Philippines and it impacted over 16 million people, over 6,000 people died in this typhoon. And it was really the first of such a major event where Quite a lot of people were protected, fortunately, by a microinsurance product. So there were, I think, over 120,000 clients claims were reported, and the insurance industry was able to really um, pay out the um, these um, claims. So it was probably not much. It was a bit more than 100 US dollars people received. But just imagine for someone who just left everything. It can really make a difference and it can at least help them to build uh, or to restart their um, building their, their lives. So, yeah, this is just one example from 2013. And of course, there are many other examples in the last um, um, couple of years that we see and also uh, very innovative uh, initiatives are arising through the use of new technologies. But maybe we can come back to that later on. Okay, yes, certainly. And thank you. That was definitely a great example of how when it is widespread, it can touch a lot of lives, even if it's just a little. So, Teresa, can you tell us, um, are there any success factors for implementing inclusive insurance? Yeah, so there are certainly uh, some features that have been proven um, useful in the past when developing uh, microinsurance or inclusive insurance products. There is, of course, not that one product that would work in every market context, but there are a couple of features that I could maybe just mention here. And let me start with the concept of Suave. This is a concept that was uh, introduced already some years ago by the Microinsurance Center. And SWAVA stands for simple, understood, accessible, valuable, and efficient. So what does that mean? That means that we need easy enrollment, we need 
ideally no exclusions or of, um, for pre-existing conditions, very easy claims processes. So simplicity is really key when it comes to inclusive insurance and to micro insurance. Um, what we also observe is that quite often these kind of products come bundled with other um, services and not only financial services, but also, I mean, services like, um, like um, input that farmers would get anyway. So the farmers buy their seed or fertilizer and in addition to that, they can uh, purchase a weather index uh, insurance product, just to give you one example. Or sometimes we have um, insurance linked with other financial services like with remittances so that the person who sends remittances to the home country can either protect um, himself, herself, or the family in the home country against certain uh, risks. Um, what has always been crucial in inclusive insurance is um, some flexibility and innovation in distribution channels. So it was always a challenge to reach the target group because they may live in a remote uh, rural area, so it can be difficult to um, to reach them. So here the industry has been also very creative and coming up with distribution channels that are trusted by the target group like churches, post offices, retailers, any kind of shops where you um, have already an existing relationship you can build on. So you can sell insurance as kind of an add-on, so to say. And of course, what is always uh, crucial um, when it comes to the development of this market is also the regulatory environment, that it should always um, strike a balance between, on the one hand, protect consumers, especially the low-income, vulnerable um, consumers that might be uh, first-time users, not very familiar with these financial services, and on the other hand, also allow for innovations. Yes. Okay. Um, just to comment on the aspect of inclusive insurance that speaks to convenience and simplicity, I think that that is one of the um, areas for persons who may not have a very trusting approach to insurance because of experiences in the past or because of stories that they might have heard. I think making the product um, in such a way that it's more accessible, more convenient, will definitely increase the uptake of the product for the persons who need it the most. Okay, uh, moving right along, despite some promising examples, most people in the world still remain unprotected. Um, what are common challenges and obstacles to inclusive insurance development? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. There are far too many still unprotected. And I think also, people may be aware of the benefits of insurance. It's still, its potential is still kind of untapped, so to say, especially by policymakers. They sometimes just forget about insurance when it, so just to give you one example, we did some research with AFI, with the Alliance for Financial Inclusion some years ago, where we analyzed current, the uh, current existing uh, financial inclusion strategies. And there it resulted that in these strategies, quite often insurance is not even mentioned once. So its potential is really still unrecognized. And I think this is one important uh, reason also for the protection gap. But of course, there are many other reasons. And um, maybe I can cluster them a little bit and start with areas that we find on the demand side. So what is uh, crucial here is awareness. So um, demand is definitely influenced by awareness. If people are not aware of the product or they don't, don't know how to use it, they will also not buy insurance. And we also have to see that this is a very, very uh, abstract concept. So insurance is something you pay someone, you get maybe a paper, but then you have to wait and maybe some at some point you would get reimbursed or maybe not. So it's a very abstract and difficult to understand uh, product. Then what is also influencing demand is trust. And we see, especially in developing or emerging countries, there is a lack of trust in formal financial service providers. So for just to give you an example, I remember a study from Peru that was published a couple of years ago. And here people 
um, stated that they would rather um, lend money with an informal uh, person somewhere on the street than with a formal bank. And same for Ghana, where um, there was also a study that showed that people trust uh, in the MNOs, the mobile network operators, but not necessarily in the insurance companies. So the mobile network operators are, this is a service they deal with on a daily basis, they know it works, and they're familiar with it. Whereas insurance, you get in touch with in the insurance company not that often. So this is certainly something that influences also the demand. And, um, and as I said before, sometimes products are just difficult to understand or products are not matching the needs of the target group and therefore the demand may also be low. But then on the other hand, we also have um, barriers on the supply side. So also for the insurance companies, it is difficult to get the necessary data to develop these products. They may not know the customer well enough to um, develop the right products. Um, also, we talk about very small premiums, but high transaction costs to, to reach the people. It can be the case that due to regulation, they are not allowed to use uh, alternative distribution channels. So all of these is also influencing the, um, the, the, the lack and supply of um, good products. And as I said before, regulation is also key. So regulation can really be an enabler of inclusive insurance growth, but it can also unintentionally hinder the development by creating unnecessary um, barriers to inclusive insurance. Thanks for that, Teresa. You raised some very relevant points in relation to the obstacles to implementing inclusive insurance in other parts of the world. Um, some were very interesting, particularly uh, the, uh, the, uh, the example of Ghana, which in that country, the persons, their citizens actually place more trust in the mobile operators uh, rather than in their traditional banking systems. And I found that to be um, a bit surprising, but obviously a product of whatever the circumstances are there. Can you share your views on what regulators should consider when scoping to regulate microinsurance? Sure, so I think uh, supervisors can really play a fundamental role when it comes to the development of inclusive insurance markets. And let me maybe start with the concept of proportionality in practice. So um, the um, insurance markets or the supervision and regulation of insurance markets is based on the ICPs, the insurance core principles developed by the IAIS. And here it is clearly stated that these ICPs can be um, applied in a proportionate manner. That means that supervisors have certain flexibility to count in certain um, market conditions. And um, as I was talking about uh, distribution channels already a lot, I think this is uh, really key um, for supervisors to allow for some flexibility to um, allow the use of alternative distribution channels. And here we have examples like from um, Zambia, where the regulator allows for um, non-financial um, intermediaries to, um, to sell insurance. So when people buy their seed or fertilizer, fertilizer um, um, they can at the same time purchase a better base, um, uh, index-based weather insurance for example, or you can have lighter training requirements for um, microinsurance um, agents. So if a person is um, selling microinsurance, simple microinsurance products only, you can decide that not the full training license is required for them. And um, of course, as I said before, um, alternative ways of distribution or um, signing up for insurance, like for example, mobile phones. This is something where certain flexibility and regulation can definitely help. Also, when it comes to incentivizing the industry, if you feel that the industry is still not entering the inclusive insurance market, you can also give them some incentives by faster product approval, for example, for microinsurance product, or um, maybe lighter regulatory fee structure, just uh, to name two uh, examples here. And then on the other hand, it might also be necessary for the regulator to think about 
different set of consumer protection measures. As I said before, these customers are vulnerable and maybe first time users. So it is important to, to ensure that they really get the claim as soon as possible, that the payoff for the claim as soon as possible. And in order to create trust, it may be useful to have a stricter timeline for complaints handling, for example. But um, so these are like on a supervisory the regulatory level, but I think there are many more ways how supervisors can help to develop the market. And one of them is related to awareness. As I said before, awareness is a very um, um, important factor. Um, and we have great examples from Ghana, from the Philippines, from Peru, where the supervisor is very much involved in awareness campaigns. So we have countries where they have um, been very creative and um, introducing uh, um, micro insurance awareness stage, just to give you one example, or they conduct roadshows and Peru, for example, they decided, decided to include insurance literacy in the school uh, curricula. So this is another um, area where the supervisor can become active. And then, of course, supervisors are in a good position to bring up the topic with um, policymakers, for example, so they can be the ones bringing the stakeholders at the table to discuss the importance of inclusive insurance. Mm. Well, Teresa, you've highlighted quite some useful tools that the regulator can employ to both protect persons who are purchasing microinsurance and to support the growth and development of that sector. So moving on then, um, can you talk about what innovative initiatives like microinsurance, um, can you give us some examples of how inclusive insurance can further benefit from recent developments in technology, um, fintech, insurtech, et cetera? Yeah, that's a very big topic at the moment. And these new technologies in insurtech are clearly transforming almost every aspect of the insurance value chain. So it goes from big data that allows to customize products to better assess risks, price risks, to um, automated claims assessment and processing. But um, maybe before I start talking about these examples, um, let me just briefly mention what are the different types of technology um, that are underpinning these uh, insure tech developments. And I will only mention a few which I feel are very um, or are crucial when it comes to inclusive insurance. And the first one is uh, digital and mobile platforms. So we see increasingly um, replacing face-to-face -face interactions with online services. And this is particularly relevant when it comes to inclusive insurance because it, it was always a challenge to reach the target market. So this can uh, make it easier to reach them and also lower the costs. Then um, a big topic is always blockchain uh, applications. For inclusive insurance, I have to say that this is still in very early stages, so we don't have that many examples. But there are already micro insurance um, products based on blockchain technology, like, for example, Consuelo from Mexico. This is an insurance company that offers um, blockchain based micro insurance to Mexican migrant workers in the US. But as I said, there's so far we have only very few examples here, but I'm pretty sure that um, it has a potential and it will be, and we will have uh, more examples here soon because it, it clearly can reduce costs. It can also increase trust uh, through the use of um, smart contracts. And it can just generally help with the infrastructure for claims payment, for example, is not in place. It can be a useful, um, solution. And another prominent example here um, is big data and artificial intelligence. So of course, the more data, the more data we gather, the more artificial intelligence we will probably need to process this data. And um, in the insurance world, big data can really help to better understand the customer and to customize the products. However, also here in the inclusive insurance uh, world, this is still a challenge in many developing and emerging countries to really gather this reliable data. 
And um, talking about data, I should probably also mention um, the increased use of satellites and remote sensing, because also the quality of the data is so much better than 10 years ago that you can really use this, um, these satellites to create data sets that will help you um, to develop um, products and that will also help you to better assess losses, for example. So these are just a few um, of the technologies that are uh, really underpinning the insure tech uh, development. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, we, um, we are living, as they say, in the information age. And so it's only right that we make use of the information that's at our fingertips. And for that to be used for improving and enhancing our offerings uh, in the way of insurance or any other type of financial services product, I think that's a great use of that information. And all these technological advancements that you've mentioned, you know, big data, digital platforms, blockchain, et cetera, they have the potential to bridge the protection gap. Uh, can you give us some examples of how that has worked? Yeah, so um, some of these applications I just mentioned can be used to, um, yeah, and I'm coming again back to the topic of distribution channels. <laughs> um, as partnerships have always been crucial in inclusive insurance partnerships with other non-insurance and non-financial um, institutions, it's again here we see, see an increased uh, introduction of uh, technology. And this is particular, particularly through the use of mobile um, insurance or mobile phones to reach new policy holders and to, to yeah, as a, yeah, as I said, it's just easier to reach them um, with these new um, distribution channels that are uh, opening up. And this can also uh, theoretically um, lower transaction costs for the insurance companies and then also for the customers. However, I'm saying theoretically here because it's not yet clear some supervisors are also a bit concerned that through the um, integration of many other stakeholders, partners, uh, this can also increase because of commissions and so on the uh, cost for the, um, for the insurance um, client. So um, another area where these new technologies can be applied is um, in making the sign up processes um, for insurance easier. Um, it may be difficult, especially for the low income people to have the um, relevant documentation, docu documentation handy that you need to um, subscribe for insurance. It may be difficult to I don't know, provide a proof of the fixed address or whatever. So here we see that insurance companies are replacing um, this by new ways and they substitute it, for example, by allowing to just uh, make a picture to prove your identity instead of sending in uh, or handing in all these um, documents. Um, same for um, premiums gathering. So also here it's always been a challenge, especially for those clients who are unbanked. And here technology can help, for example, premiums can be paid by using airtime on a cell phone or mobile wallets. And it's the same for premium, premium uh, for, sorry, for claims payout. Also here, if people don't have a bank account, it can be challenging, but through, for example, mobile wallet, it can be much easier to, um, to pay out the claim. However, what I would say, I mean, these are all new developments. Um, it's still lots of experimenting here. But what I would say are really the key um, intratech developments that have had really an impact on the inclusive insurance world are, first of all, um, mobile insurance. And mobile insurance means any kind of insurance that is um, sold through, um, a, used through a mobile phone or where you can pay your uh, premium through the use of a mobile phone. And this is uh, clearly the most powerful innovation so far, I would say. So in Ghana, for example, it is already the most used uh, distribution channel for inclusive insurance. And there, the supervisor has already developed, uh, two or three years ago, has already developed a guidance um, 
for this new um, distribution of, um, of insurance. And the um, second big innovation that is very important in the inclusive insurance landscape is um, index-based insurance. And this is particularly relevant for smallholder farmers. So the typical crop indemnity insurance um, might be just um, too expensive to implement them for um, smallholder farmers. And index-based insurance, in contrast, um, so it's not it's not assessing the actual loss. So you don't need someone going there assess the actual loss, but it is using um, um, a tr trigger. We call it so you whenever the um, the index is reached. So let's say we have a certain amount of rainfall or so. Whenever this um, is reached, then you get an automatic payout. This would not necessarily match the actual loss that um, you're facing, but it is much easier and it really um, makes it possible to ensure um, these uh, type of customers. So um, yeah, I, I would say that these are probably so far the most um, 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 impactful developments in the intro tech. Um, the intro tech side and it's also maybe just to conclude it's also not just one single technology um, that overturned the inclusive insurance overnight but it's rather a combination of different uh, technologies and it's also a combination often of online and offline so uh, especially mnos report that it's still important to have some form of interaction uh, personal interaction with the clients so for example, they still organize world shows to raise awareness, but then at the same time, allow people to sign up for a micro insurance product using their um, smartphones. And generally, as I um, also mentioned before, the more fancy um, applications like artificial intelligence, blockchain, it's still in very um, um, early stages and have not yet such a big impact on inclusive insurance. However, I'm sure that also this will change in the near future. Um, however, let me just conclude by saying that I think we should also be careful and not make the mistake to focus only on these new technologies because this also depends on the country context. So you may have countries with a young population, very techy population who um, countries where you have a good uh, stable internet connection and there these new technologies may be uh, a, a very uh, prominent um, uh, tool. But on the other hand, you have countries where people still prefer the face-to-face -face interaction, even that might, might be uh, more expensive, but it's still important for them to have this direct contact with the insurance company. Great, great. Uh, thank you for um for discussing that with us in terms of um, examples of how they can, how inclusive insurance can benefit from these technological advances. Uh, you mentioned that in Ghana that the regulator there has um, issued guidelines on um, different channels of providing microinsurance. And you did highlight, of course, that each country context is different. However, can you can you tell us what are the regulatory implications that are arising from these new technologies? Um, what are the new risks or any other things that the regulator might have to consider? Yeah, so um, these developments are definitely fast uh, moving and are a challenge for regulators for existing regulatory frameworks. And in addition, there are also new risks arising from these new technologies. So uh, generally, I think it is important for supervisors to uh, provide regulatory certainty. This is important for insure tech or um, insurance startups to have this regulatory certainty in short time frame. So this is uh, probably crucial, but it, on the other hand, also very difficult for not all insurance supervisors are blockchain experts, and they probably also don't have to be the experts on that, but they have to be open to discuss it with the industry they have to be open to learn more about um, these developments and not just say okay we, we we don't know what exactly this is what technology lies behind it and are therefore reluctant to approve these new products so i think here the dialogue uh, with the relevant um, industry players will be very important and even more important in future and also when it comes to regulation it's um, 
important that um, these new regulations are future proof so, so that they don't become out of date when technology evolves. So just to give you an example, because SUSEP, the Brazilian Supervisory Authority, introduced already, in, it was already in 2005 when they introduced uh, the use of remote means for micro insurance. And there they did not specify which remote means, but they um, left it rather open so that um, also new model, models can um, fall under this um, regulation. So it's not only e-signatures, but now it also uh, covers, for example, biometric signatures. So um, it's the, the dialogue with the industry, but then with these new partners and new partnerships, it's also the dialogue with other supervisory regulatory bodies. So if, for example, the mobile network operators are involved, it's also important to um, discuss with the regulator who is actually supervising what uh, when it comes to mobile insurance, to give you just that. Uh, just one example. And um, as I said, there are also new risks, so it may also be necessary to update existing consumer protection regimes to make sure that policyholders are adequately um, protected. And there are different ways, and also here it depends on the context of a country. So we see a number of countries that are establishing sandboxes or innovation hubs to provide the industry with uh, regulatory exemptions um, to test certain innovations in a safe uh, space, then we have uh, regulators in other countries that decide to let the market um, um, actively evolve and then just monitor it closely to really better understand these developments before intervening here. And uh, which way uh, a country or supervisor um, chooses really depends on the country uh, context and also depends on what resources we have in place. So a formal sandbox uh, is very resource uh, intense. So you also have to make sure that we have enough people um, available to work on that. And um, maybe just um, to conclude here, I think, um, these are all promising developments and they will certainly um, keep changing the uh, insurance uh, landscape. But um, we should also be aware of that these developments can maybe even lead to more exclusion in some cases and they can bring even more consumer protection challenges. So just um, think about the digital divide and this is something that came out clearly now also in the current situation in the pandemic um, that there is the world is divided in people who have a good stable internet connection and those who have not. And this can also lead to, to um, exclusion. And we have not only the digital divide, but we have also have a gender divide here. So uh, we see that um, women are less likely to have a, a mobile phone with access to um, internet, for example. And then with the use of big data, it can, of course, it can help to customize products. But on the other hand, with um, the collection of all this data, it can also be um, that you're unintentionally discriminating based on certain aspects. Um, and that for some people, it would just be impossible to um, be insured. So there's lots of potential, but we should also see that there are some risks and also the supervisor will have to deal with these risks. And I think it's just important for the supervisor to really strike balance between protecting the um, consumers, but on the other hand, also allow for, um, for these uh, new technologies to um, evolve. Okay, Teresa, thank you so much for that mouthful that you have given us. You've certainly provided a lot of information, a lot of thought-provoking information for us to consider here in relation to um, inclusive insurance and microinsurance. What are the obstacles? Some very salient examples of how it has worked in practice. And just in general, the opportunities and, and the possibilities that it provides in terms of being able to protect those that are lacking such protection. Um, there are persons, as you said, who are disenfranchised who don't necessarily have the same access to um, certain products, certain technologies, and we have to find a way to, to roll those persons into the fold and be able to offer the, the peace of mind and, and financial stability that insurance offers, and that should be available for everyone. So in closing, do you have any final remarks that you would like to provide um, for our listeners? 
Well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me to take part in this webinar series and for the opportunity to share um, some thoughts on inclusive insurance here. So um, I would say um, it is really something, I, I, I feel that there are many good developments and there are many new developments that will help to close the protection gap, but I think there's still so much work that needs to be done. And I think what is really crucial is that we um, create a, a, an atmosphere of dialogue, that we come together, that we discuss these topics with all the relevant stakeholders, and that we, yeah, that they, we are really open to also hear from others what their thoughts are on the topic of inclusive insurance. Yes, certainly. And we here at the Angola Financial Services Commission would also like to thank you, Teresa, for joining us today. And we'd like to commend A2II for its tremendous work that it has been doing in the way of inclusive insurance, outreach, awareness, capacity building, etc. And so in closing, I would like to say thank you again to uh, Tranquility Beach. And we will look forward to speaking with you again in another installment, Teresa. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. The Anguilla Financial Services Commission would like to thank Access to Insurance Initiative, A2II, for their participation. Any references within this episode can be found in the links provided below. For more information on our fintech licensed businesses, please contact us by email at innovate at afsc.ai.